The Empire. Average holding infantry, strong missiles and artillery, supported by great cavalry and magic. In this video, I'll show you every unit from the Empire roster and include their stats before and after research, XP and redline skills. I will also go over the Lords and their specific abilities and skills they gain in campaign. So as an example of what you're about to see, basically I do have the unit card on the left, but I have it also upgraded in the, the right, which is all the effects after research, after XP and redline skills. Note that you also have a purple uh, value there. Whenever that purple value shows up, it is because those bonuses come from a specific lord, in this case the Huntsman General. Those are the buffs that a Huntsman General can give to, for instance in this case, great swords. So the Empire Army consists typically of average infantry. They can be supported by your heroes and lords, as you're going to see in just a moment. They do have great missiles and artillery, great cavalry. They lack single entities other than the Siege Tank and Luminarch. Uh, I'm talking more about the typical melee uh, going uh, single entities, of course, like monsters, for instance, they don't have those. And they lack flying. Other than flying mounts, of course, for their lords and heroes, they lack those flyers. So, in essence, the Empire is about holding the line and doing the old hammer and anvil tactic or peppering down the, the enemy with missiles and artillery. That's the sort of idea that they go for. We begin with none other than Emperor Karl Franz. A great armor duelist, Karl Franz excels at defeating enemy lords and heroes. Tons of armor magical attacks and melee, great melee attack. Although quite lower melee defense and tons of armor piercing weapon damage, as well as a great charge bonus, always charge him in. He'll do really well versus anyone in single combat. In terms of abilities in campaign, Karl Franz will get the Reichland Runefang, an area buff giving 24 melee attack and 8 leadership to your allies, as well as the hold the line ability here, more melee defense and leadership for your allies as well. In terms of his quest items, he gets the Drakwald Runefang for a whopping 40% physical resistance and even reduced Vigor per second, so basically he'll have uh, no issues with the Vigor. And then the Galmaraz, giving him a nice bonus to armor piercing damage as well as a bonuses versus large. And now to a very famous wizard with the lore of metal, Balthazar Gelt. He's very weak in single combat, very low armor, melee attack, defense, weapon strength, etc. In essence, you should always keep him away from the enemy or he'll be down in a second. His main purpose, of course, is being a very awesome spellcaster with the lore of metal, as I've said. So yeah, but just ensure that he doesn't get into single combat anytime soon. So in campaign he'll have the Soland Runefang giving minus 8 leadership to enemies around, so it's really good, especially when he gets his mount for him to keep uh, lowering the enemy leadership around, it's really awesome. Now we also have the uh, hold the line abilities, so it affects, uh, gives melee defense and leadership, you've seen this, to enemy nearby uh, allies. And then we have the Staff of Volans. So basically this gives him a great power recharge rate and it reduces his miscast chance by 50%. Now for your ranged legendary lord, Markers Wolfheart. He's very good at sniping enemy single entities. In combat, in melee combat, he still has low armor, but good melee attack and decent melee defense. Uh, average weapon strength, so he can survive a bit in single combat, maybe defeat some uh, lower quality heroes, like uh, casters for instance, definitely. He's much better, of course, from afar. A good ranged attack, uh, armor piercing missiles, also with a bonuses versus large, so he's really good at those hitting those large targets including lords or heroes on mounts uh, definitely his main target would be being this hunter uh, you also can take advantage of the fact that he has vanguard deployment he can fire whilst moving and he also has stalk so he can hide and then hit the enemy uh, with a nasty surprise especially of course against any anti-large uh, units against any large units sorry <laughs> 
So for his abilities in a uh, campaign, he has focused shot magic missile with a good damage, good range, only useful really versus single entities, because it only affects them if they are single entities. Then he also has fleet footed. This is basically a better acceleration in speed if there is an enemy present, so he can escape a little bit better. He also has the basic hold the line, you already saw that, melee defense, leadership, if any allies are in range, of course. Then he also has the, uh, the ability sure and true this passive ability giving uh, armor piercing missile damage uh, base missile damage and reload skill to allies in range uh, do you have also the executioner this is an upgrade to the focused shot uh, and magic missile as well but this time you can target anything else but it's still good against large combatants and good against armor finally one of the best two abilities that he has one is the upgrade to the other so hunter snare causes enemies in an area to not move for 11 seconds so great ability uh, just trap the enemies and ensure that you get uh, all those uh, 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 hunters firing on it it's really good and then it upgrades to the hunter's trap which does the same but with 22 seconds so anything it grabs your troops will make short work of it and finally on his quest he can get the ember bow which does have two uses of a magic missile good against large targets again so re reinforcing his ability to wreck anything large really fast Next we have Volkmar the Grim, a support lord by all means, he's still decent in combat, not a lot of armor, decent melee attack and defense values, average weapon strength, he can still be used on his mount and after his abilities on the front line as you'll see later, but until then be careful. He also has fire and magical attacks good for countering specific enemies with a weakness versus those, keep him close with your infantry for support and that's about how he plays out the best. So Volkmar in campaign has the Grand Hammer of Sigmar as well, melee attack plus 24, affecting allies in range. He also has Divine Power, giving enemies higher miscast range as well. Then we have the Grand Shield of Faith, which is basically a ward safe for allies who are affected by it, you know, nearby. Then we have the Grand Soul Fire. Note that this is not just the bombardment, it doesn't affect friendly troops. This is also great, uh, specifically, so you can cast this while your troops are engaging, which is excellent. Uh, then, in addition, he still has Hold the Line, you know, that basic ability, melee defense, leadership to allies. And then he has the, let me see if I can find it, it is uh, over here. Yeah, he has the strength of the penitent given to the whole army. This is basically for the flagellants only, but he gives it to the whole army. Physical resistance and melee defense to the whole army when they are uh, in melee, and it only recharges if they are losing melee combat. So if they're losing, then certainly they'll likely stop losing. He also has Faith's Bastion, so a ward save uh, uh, for him plus 30 percent duration 22 seconds and then the benediction aura basically so this is always active once you have a passive ability giving leadership to all allies in range and finally the two biggest ones honestly the passive ability that he can get from the jade griffin item it is a regeneration ability and just a special note for this the uh, war altar of sigma actually makes him unbreakable so uh, he becomes quite tanky and quite the front line uh, to deal with anyone really then we have the general of the empire your typical melee lord good in single combat with the bronze shield and armor so he can survive versus those missiles decent melee attack and melee defense values good weapon strength although not a lot of armor piercing he has a good charge bonus so always take advantage of that too it's always nice to take advantage of a good charge bonus overall he's a decent lord to fight other lords and heroes quite the basic but still uh, a good addition to your armies definitely so the only really ability that the generals of the Empire have is the, still the basic one, the hold the line ability. So melee defense leadership, just make sure that he is near your uh, infantry lines to make the most out of it or use him with the cavalry by all means. But yeah, just ensure that he's ready to lead the forces into battle. Now for the Huntsman General, a basic ranged lord, similar to uh, Wolfhard, he's good at sniping enemy characters and mounts or monsters, not a lot in terms of melee skills, that's not his main uh, course of action, of course, his main idea, he can survive it a little bit, but his main use is, of course, using that uh, range, using that missile strength that has a really good bonuses versus large, that's how he'll take down the, those monsters, those lords and heroes and mounts, and yeah, 
that's basically it for this hero. Do note that he, like uh, Wolfhart, he also has Stalk and he also has Vanguard deployment, so you can use that with some tactical advantages on the battlefield. For your Huntsman General, he has the Oil Flask, basically a magic missile that applies uh, uh, less speed on contact and plus 50% flame weakness to the target. So this basically is a two set of a combo. The next one is the Arrow of Aquish, basically another magic missile that causes lots of fire damage. So of course, uh, this is obviously to be used with Oil. First throw it, then get the Arrow and the enemy gets a ton of damage. He also has the Hold the Line, already explained it to you, basically around the area melee defense and leadership to allies then we have the sure and true ability this gives uh, the same thing as wolfheart more damage reload skill in an area to allies and he gets the quiver of actually replacing the arrow so magic missiles number of projectiles it's two actually still causing lots of fire damage good against multiple combatants then he also has the Hail of Fire, and then it's upgrade. I'll speak about the Hail. It's imbuing flaming attacks and increases allies' reload skill. And finally, the uh, Funnel of Flame. This does exactly the same, but for a longer duration. And finally, we have the Arc Lector, your support lord. Great to have with your front line. Has decent stats to survive in single combat. He has good melee defense, so he's better at taking some damage out. He has good armor, so all points out to being a massive tank. He has magical attacks, so he can still put the hurt on anyone that has physical resistance, of course. Uh, just ensure that he has some support of some infantry units and lead the army from the front with him. For his abilities in campaign, we do have the Divine Power, basically giving enemies plus 50% miscast chance. Then we have the Grand Hammer of Sigma, a battle prayer giving allies melee attack plus 24 to allies in range, of course. Then we have the Grand Shield of Faith. This is similar, giving allies in range a 20% ward save. Always excellent. In addition, we also have a bombardment ability with the Grand Soul Fire. Just base damage with a large strike area, good for clusters of low armored troops. In addition, we have the Hold the Line ability, melee defense, leadership, affecting allies in range, always, always decent, always nice. And then the Faith's Bastion here, a ward save for himself of 20%. And finally, for the final ability that he can get, the Benediction, plus 8 leadership to nearby allies. The Empire Captain, a basic melee hero with the bronze shield, decent armor, decent melee attack, but not a lot of melee defense, so he's kind of weak in that regard. Uh, average weapon strength, not a lot of armor piercing weapon damage, so not really that good against armored opponents. He's still good to hunt down enemy heroes or lords with some support. So your Empire Captain in uh, campaign, he has the uh, Hold the Line ability. This is a passive ability, fighting allies in range all the time, melee defense and le in leadership. So of course, lead with him on the front line so that he can pass on this buff to other units. Then we have your support warrior, the warrior priest. He has decent armor, although no shield, even though maybe that book could be used, I don't know. He has decent melee attack and magical attacks, but fairly low melee defense, so he's kind of weak, he'll suffer some damage. And not a lot really of weapon strength, not a lot of armor piercing there, just base weapon strength. He's often best, of course, to support your other units in the front line. For abilities, the Warrior Priests have the Divine Power, giving enemies plus 50% miscast chance. They also have the Hammer of Sigma, which gives uh, allies a uh, melee attack plus 24 for 25 seconds. You also have the Shield of Faith, another battle prayer, affects allies in range with um, damage resistance, ward save. Then we also have a Soul Fire, which is a bombardment spell, basically, that does not affect uh, friendly troops, by the way. And we do have the Faith's Bastion. This acts for him, basically gives uh, damage resistance, so a ward save for him, 20%. And in addition, Benediction, yet another passive aura that gives allies and him, of course, a leadership plus 8. And then we have the Witch Hunter, a missile specialist range hero, basically kind of average in terms of his melee capabilities, even though he can handle some punishment and has magical attacks. His best strength is actually the missile attacks, of course, having armor piercing weapon uh, damage that is also magical. Basically. 
he's best at taking out enemy single entities from afar and then close in for the kill. He does have some nice spell resistance and can fire as well whilst moving. In campaign, the Witch Hunter actually has the ability Accusation, so reducing the missile resistance, physical resistance, melee defense and armor of a target for 35 seconds. Now it has a reduced range, which is why it's a little bit difficult to use, but still you'll be able to stalk towards that uh, target, uh, definitely. You'll be able to uh, to get use the Slippery ability perhaps to reach it faster, which is a... a, a a speed buff and more melee defense so definitely try to use this this acquisition ability to ensure that a specific target gets down really fast your basic caster hero the wizard available in beasts death fire heaven shadows life and light lores i believe i didn't miss any uh, relies on its magic and combat since he's very flimsy fighting hand to hand uh, keep him out of harm's way very low armor very low melee attack and defense so ensure he's safe behind your troops to use his spells Gotrek, everyone's favorite dwarf he's a powerful melee hero without any armor with a ton of melee attack and good defense as well as magical attacks he also does quite a lot of armor piercing damage with the hefty bonuses versus large. So he's great at taking out anyone, especially any large targets. In terms of abilities, he does have, of course, the typical deadly onslaught and foe seeker. And you also have the rune axe of Gotrek, which causes dampen, removing magical attacks and spell resistance to enemies, and gives him 50% armor piercing weapon damage. Gotrek's Doom also gives him 40 melee defensive, 40% ward safe, which is excellent for him to survive. This is how he survives. In addition, he also has a heroic fortitude, a passive ability regeneration with only one use. If his hit points are really low, less than 10%, he has the chance of gaining hit points. And if it wasn't enough, he also has Death Blow, giving him a lot of weapon damage and armor piercing weapon damage when his hit points are less than 20%. So overall, an excellent fighter for your front lines. And by the way, he does have tons of hit points as well, which also helps. Felix, a decent melee hero, more of a support one. He has decent armor, but no shield, a good melee attack and melee defense values, and he also causes armor piercing missile damage and for the most part, and a bonuses versus infantry, so his main use uh, will be against other enemy infantry, or small targets, of course. Now, in terms of abilities, he does have Helping Hand, uh, a buff that gives 40 melee attack and ward safe to any lord or hero in 50 meters around him. It is great to ensure that they both survive and do additional damages, of course. Now, Karag Ghoul gives him flaming attacks and more melee attack and even further bonuses versus infantry, making him really good at taking out enemy infantry, regardless of how strong they are. And finally, we do have the Blood Oath. This is his particular skill. He gives regeneration generation to up to two lords or heroes in range while he's in melee. Therefore, Felix is an, an amazing support hero for your other lords or heroes. And then we have the new Ulrika, a nice hybrid hero. Ulrika gives some nice flexibility to your roster. She's a spellcaster with the lore of shadows and then has decent melee stats. Not a lot of armor, but good melee attack and defense as well as bonuses versus infantry there. Now, the biggest issue is that she also has a range attack with a good range of 180, so she can even outrange most missile units with fairly good missile damage, actually. Now, she's overall a good combatant. Remember that she's undead, so she does have that crumbling issue but her possibility uh, her abilities actually prove she proves incredibly tough to kill let's start with that so she's undead yes but she also has the hunger so when in melee she'll replenish her uh, her hit points now she also has the by our blood ability from Kislev so if she if the leadership ever goes down she actually turns unbreakable so it's, it's amazing <laughs> the combination is just really crazy undead with unbreakable and then she has great abilities, activated abilities, uh, giving her physical resistance of 40% and melee defense and the enemies nearby a reduced melee attack. So nope. when, she, when this is active, yes, it only lasts 23 seconds, but basically she is really unharmed during that, that part. And then she can imbue with blind, so basically reducing several stats of the enemy while also increasing, heavily increasing her accuracy. And in addition, she can also 
have the silver dagger, a more basic uh, bonus b b uh, in itself, but she does get magical attacks, which is useful against those with physical resistance, of course, and more weapon damage and armor piercing weapon damage. So incredibly tough to kill this uh, the, this hero. Always a good choice if you can have uh, her in one of your armies, by all means. So for your first infantry unit, the Spearman. Basic unit, basic, uh, almost chaff unit, let's say. They do have poor melee attack, but great melee defense, so they're good at holding the line. Not a lot of armor, no shield, which is the big, biggest difference here. They do have that uh, anti-large bonus, of course, so they're better at defeating, you know, lighter cavalry, lighter monsters, perhaps. They do have that charge defense versus large and charge reflection, so they'll give back some additional damage when they they are attacking enemies who charge them. Now, in the late game, of course, they get pretty much good upgrades. Let's say it, it just enhances their ability to withstand some more punishment, more of a defensive unit. Uh, but of course, the lack of shields will you know will mean that you'll likely want the next unit instead. And that's the units, the spearmen, the same, but with shields. So they do have that bronze shield, making them much better for a frontline unit. Not a lot in terms of melee attack, but much better melee defense, and still the same weapon strength with the bonus versus large, charge reflection, charge defense versus large. So basically the same, but just an improved version of the spearmen. However, these guys in the late game, maybe the mid game, they'll still become quite good holding infantry. They won't do a lot of damage, but the best purpose, of course, for them is to hold the line, which they will hold. So don't neglect these guys, especially for some sweeper armies, perhaps armies that you wish to use against lighter opponents. By all means, use these guys, they'll do their work well. Next we have the Swordsman, a basic shielded infantry, nothing too shabby about them, nothing too interesting about them. They do have better melee attacks than the uh, value than the uh, Spearmen, of course, so they're much better on the offense, still with a decent melee def defense. This is kind of like the staple of infantry, let's say. They'll do some damage, but don't expect them to do anything that, that much against any uh, armored opponents, for instance. Not a lot of armor piercing there. Uh, so in the late game, you'll be able to use these guys more effectively as a frontline infantry, maybe like a tier 1 and a half, tier 2 infantry, really. Uh, just don't expect them, as always, to, to have them against any chosen, for instance, or anything with a high armor. They're very good at clearing up uh, uh, lower uh, quality units, for sure, uh, especially with some support from, you know, some auras, some uh, uh, frontline heroes or lords. Now to a regiment of renown, the Sigma Sons, a much better frontline unit, especially because of their higher melee attack and melee defense values, and still a little bit higher weapon strength. They do have a good charge bonus, so if, unless you really need to be bracing, just charge him in to get that charge bonus as well. The main difference, of course, is that they are unbreakable, and this is great for specific combinations, where all that you need is for them to stay there and don't move while you're getting a hammer and anvil, or while peppering the enemy with a missile fire, or maybe for a magical ability. So that's their main use. Wherever you put them, they will stay there, un there until they die, which is great for any infantry unit. It allows a lot of tactical options. Now, for one of the better units in the roster, the Halberdiers. They are armor-piercing and anti-large, which is a deadly combination against any cover unit, really. So, if you manage to get these guys into prolonged combat with anything that is large, they'll do a lot of damage, they'll ensure that that unit either is defeated or that it pays the price of trying to engage these guys. They don't have a lot of armor, nor a shield, which is their weakness. Be wary against enemy uh, units with a heavy missile fire, of course. Still that charge defense versus large, still that charge reflection, so make sure that they are bracing. Uh, in the late game, they become much better, much via more viable as even a frontline uh, unit. Just be wary of those missiles, of course, of any missiles. Uh, and especially with the Huntsman General, you see that number in purple, that will be for the Huntsman General. They can become quite the menace against anything large, so useful against those armies that f uh, have a lot of large units, like the Lism, and for instance, that's mainly what the, the the purpose is. So leading with it, uh, Huntsman General and getting that skill is always nice for these guys to become a powerful uh, front line. Just always careful with the missiles. Now to a more 
specialized units, say, the flagellants. They are a damage dealer unit. They do have frenzy and uh, are unbreakable, which is basically their idea. Whatever you put them, they won't uh, run away until they're dead. They don't have any armor whatsoever. They're naked, as you can see there, almost, just with some rags they, that won't cover them. Uh, so their fanaticism is their best uh, tool. They do have great melee attack, but very poor melee defense. But remember that, uh, in essence, the strength of the penitent is what will give them some reliability, some survivability. So when they are in melee, uh, they will get some physical resistance and melee defense, which is always nice. The weapon strength is not uh, predominantly armor piercing but it still has a good amount and also you do have a charge bonus so since they don't take too much uh, you know anything <laughs> in terms of defensive just make them charge whoever is charging them and they'll do a good damage now in the late game they can't still be they can still be useful not really against anything that will have higher missile power of course because they'll get wrecked very easily but still the main usage of these units is precisely against uh, to ensure that they uh, stay wherever you put them so that other units can go and hammer an anvil for instance which is the greatest idea you taking use of that unbreakable they get better melee defense and melee attack but nothing that will make them a front line typically uh, if you're going to use these guys maybe with something that provides a little bit more support and always relying on that unbreakable ability now for Regiment of Renown, the Tatter Souls, for challenge Regiment of Renown. So what is the big deal about these guys is that they are actually 160. So the other units are 120, so they have more models, they have more hit points, they'll do more damage overall because they'll survive longer. Just as always as the other Flagellants, keep them away from any missile units for sure because they'll get wrecked by those. And they're good damage dealers, good to maybe use in uh, combat with other uh, infantry units that will soak for them the damage damage or with you know someone supporting them as always the main usage that I f uh, find for these guys is the fact that of course they have unbreakable so whatever you put them they will stay there it's good to put them on a hill for instance because they'll get a little bit more benefit fighting on a hill so yeah that sort of idea that sort of tactic that's what you should be thinking of these guys and now for the elite unit of the Empire, the Great Swords. They're heavily armored, 95 armor is quite good. Uh, not a lot of melee attack or melee defense, but they do have a nice weapon strength of armor piercing damage with a bonuses versus infantry. So they're good at taking out any armored targets, uh, especially infantry targets, of course. Uh, the main difference in the late game, they do become quite a good front line. They get much more armor, better leadership overall, so they'll survive longer, they'll do more damage, get better melee defense and attack value is better weapon strength, better everything really, and they still get a little bit of physical resistance. So with the support from heroes and lords, they become quite a good front line. Their weakness is, uh, of course, is the fact that they lack any shield. That's the thing that I would add uh, for them to be a proper good front line unit. Uh, so no shield, of course, and be careful against those missile units and be careful against any overwhelming opponents such as, you know, chosen with great weapons or something like that. They'll sti still put some hurt on them, but don't expect them to defeat them without some support. Archers are your first missile unit, a very basic missile unit, uh, not a lot in terms of combat stats, they'll lose against nearly anything that jumps them, so be careful with that, keep them safe, keep them covered. Uh, they do have a... Uh, a good, uh, slightly good range. It could be better, uh, but uh, the w the missile strength is not bad actually for a unit that is this early in the game and that is uh, this cheap. Let's say uh, in the after upgrades, of course, they become much better, but more of course into their uh, weapons, their missile strength and. Uh, the, the reload time, of course, they'll fire much faster. Uh, under Huntsman General, they get a little bit more range, which is also useful. Uh, but don't cut out these guys for uh, prolonged periods. You know, it's go a good unit for the early game, but don't just don't expect them to be, uh, you know, any staple for the mid or late game. Now, for a regiment of renown, an interesting one is the Death Jacks archers. So, the advantage of these guys is that they have Vanguard deployment and they also have Snipe, which allows them to remain hidden while firing, which is great, especially if you can find a target for them. Uh, if the enemy doesn't realize, they're going to pepper them down and do a lot of damage. And of course, they have Stalk, so they'll remain hidden. That's the idea behind these guys. Just put the hurt on something that the enemy is not expecting, you know, and they won't be able to see them until they get very close. Close. So yeah, a good overall uh, uh, 
regiment of renowned unit, uh, good for some tat tactical uh, ideas on the battlefield. Now to the Free Company Militia. It's a hybrid unit. It's they're fairly decent. It's like it says here, fairly decent me melee combatant. So they don't have a lot of armor. They don't have a lot of melee attack or melee defense, but they can still survive better than the typical um, uh, archer unit, let's say. The advantage, of course, is that they do have that range. They do have that missile strength, of course. So they'll put the hurt on the enemies when they're approaching with their missile strength, and then they'll finish them, them off. Uh, that's the expectation, of course, to finish them off in uh, uh, melee combat. They do have Vanguard deployment which is always nice and they fire whilst moving. It's always excellent to have these sort of abilities, especially against slower opponents. Maybe they can use their speed in that advantage. And in the late game, actually, they become a little bit better because their stats also improve, their combat stats improve, but their missile strength also improve. To the point that they will be able to reload much faster with the better damage overall so whoever tries to hit to to come forward and fight them will have to face a, a good volleys of, of fire until they fight in combat so good against weaker uh, enemies you can use these guys well into the mid game basically but just don't expect them to be the the, the most useful after that point unless you do give them a lot of support and now to a Regiment of Renown, the Sterling's Revenge, Free Company Militia ROR. Basically better stats overall, better melee attack and melee defense, so they're kind of like Swordsman, really the shorter version of Swordsman, basically. Uh, they do have the advantage of having armor piercing missile uh, the strength, so they're much better at dealing with all kinds of enemies, of course. They do have still that Vanguard deployment, they still have that Stalk. So basically they're good to hide and deliver a, a, a big surprise to your enemies. So a much better unit to have nearly in any army. Just a good tactical advantage for you to try and use. Uh, and especially, I always like when there's some tactical advantage with these units. That's the main purpose for this. And they're really good at what they do. Especially up until the mid game, maybe late game not so much. But up until the mid game they can do really well. Crossbowman. Basically, I, this is the unit that I believe I make all the calculations in terms of ranged units with, because they're just such a staple in the army. They don't have a lot of good uh, combat stats, so just be wary of it, engaging them in combat, they're not that good at it. The good thing is that they do have quite a lot of range, especially for, uh, you know, a human faction, they do have quite a lot of range. The missile strength is not really that good, but it has some substantial armor-piercing damage, so don't count them off, they'll be able to put the hurt on nearly anyone. Especially Especially in the late game, you can still bring quite a lot of crossbowmen, unless you're dealing with heavily armored uh, units, you can bring the crossbowmen and they'll do a lot of damage. Especially with that missile strength increased, more ammunition of course is always nice, and they also get better stats. Maybe they can survive, you know, some wolves that uh, jump on them or something like that, but really be careful of that regardless. Uh, keep them safe, just use them focus firing on any specific target and they'll do short work of them. Now to a much better elite, let's say, uh, uh, missile unit, the handgunners. They are armor-piercing missile unit, so they'll put the hurt on anyone that is armored, of course. Much better for that. They have reduced range compared to the crossbowmen, but overall the same type of idea. Just keep them out of harm's way. In the late game, of course, they become a menace to anything that has armor, because their weapon strength even increases their reload time as well. Just be certain, as always, to have line of fire, that's the main issue with the handguns in comparison to the, the crossbowmen, is that the handgunners do require the line of fire, be careful with that, hit the big targets, the big monsters or the, the entities that are flying perhaps, that's a good, always a surefire way of ensuring that you can fire, but yeah, a good addition to any army whatsoever, regardless of if it is early to late game. And now to a regiment of renown, the Silver Bullets. These are a great armor-piercing missile unit, much better missile strength, better stats overall, of course. They have magical ammunition, so they're really good at it, uh, especially if hitting any enemies. They're like demons that have physical resistance or ethereal units, of course. They have a little bit of more range, of course, that's always nice, and they still have the stalk. So they can move hidden, they can hit their targets. Uh, it's a good tactical advantage to have these guys. Uh, it's always a nice unit to have in any army, and wherever you have it, of course, make sure that you don't use it just as another handgunner unit. Make sure that you engage with that uh, stalk ability, with that uh, tactical advantage, so that you can get the most out of them. 
And now to yet another specialized missile unit, the Huntsman. These are anti-large, that's their purpose. Their missile strength includes an anti-large bonus, so they should be used precisely against those large targets. Uh, they don't have a lot of melee stats, so please keep them away, to, uh, away from any melee combat. They have a decent range, so for those uh, uh, fights against Lizardmen, fights against anything that really brings a lot of cavalry or large targets, by all means, uh, a couple of these guys will always do nicely. In advantage, they have Vanguard deployment as well, and they can fire whilst moving, so that's always a good idea. They also have Stalk, so the main idea behind these guys is that you can even use them on the flanks if you have good cavalry to cover for them, for instance, or some infantry they can rely uh, reliably hold for them. They'll be able to defeat cavalry, you know, from afar. That's their main usage, especially in the late game they gain some quite some interesting bonuses especially under huntsman general because they give they uh, get much more range so 180 under a huntsman general and all the other stats improving of course more melee uh, more uh, more melee defense more melee attack which is always nice because that will ensure that if they are caught off guard they can survive a little bit it's only the only unit about of the uh, other than the, the, the free company militia that can do this, you know, they can survive if you forget about them for a while, for instance. Uh, and you do have some good uh, improvements also. I mentioned the range, the weapon strength, the reload time, it's much better. This is always important to ensure that you manage to get uh, the most out of them as quickly as possible. So a good unit to have to focus fire single entities, big monsters, that's their main purpose. That's what I would use them for. Now to a regiment of renown, the White Wolves. Much better stats overall. These are a good uh, uh, unit that can withstand some punishment in combat, of course. Try not to, but of course uh, they are much better than the regular Huntsman at that. They still have that anti-large bonus, which is always great. So their main purpose is, of course, defeating from afar enemy uh, large entities. The advantage of these guys is that they do have some encouragement to do to all other units, which is always great. And themselves, they have uh, the immunity to psychology, which is always, always nice. So with that Vanguard, uh, they are relatively fast so you can use these guys again you know, in vanguard and just fall back to to your front lines to get the most they do fire whilst moving so you're never going to lose you know have to control all the the volleys or anything so a good unit to spring a nasty surprise against the end uh, uh, an enemy cavalry unit that is coming in uh, of course and then you'll put the halberds there and suddenly they, they've done nothing other than just uh, receiving some missile fire from these guys a good tactical option just be wary of getting them into co uh, combat with you know something that is anti-infantry for instance it has good combat values For the first cavalry unit, the Empire Knights. They are armored, heavily armored actually, and they do have a bronze shield, so they can survive against some missiles that hit them. Not a lot in terms of melee attack, but good melee defense, so they can survive a little bit in combat, but their best idea is to be used, of course, as a shock cavalry. They do have a good charge bonus. In particular, in the late game, the improvements that you get are mostly towards that. They get better charge bonus, better melee defense, better armor, so you can still use these guys as a uh, shock cavalry of course you can have them reliably against lower quality uh, troops in melee of course but just be sure that you know how to cycle charge because that's their main usage especially in the late game against more powerful foes remember they don't don't, don't have a lot of uh, armor piercing weapon strength so be wary of engaging anything that will has a lot of armor now for a cool looking unit, I really love the, the models of these guys, the Reichsguard. They are also armored and shielded, a little bit more armored than the previous one, still with that bronze shield, so they can survive against missile fire for sure. Better melee attack than melee defense, so this offsets them more into the shock cavalry idea, you know, uh, typically that's how you can see it, you know, with a good charge bonus, as you can see this. So much better than the Empire Knights fighting in that style, shock uh, uh, cavalry indeed. Uh, just engage them with them uh, in the flanks of the enemy, in the rear of the enemy. That's where you are supposed to. Uh, in the late game, they do get some some decent bonuses, some physical resistance that you can see there. They gain some good melee attack values and defense values, even more charge bonus. So 
the advantage is that they get to the point where they are actually a melee cavalry. So you can just fire and forget them. They'll defeat most enemies. Just be sure that they are not that heavily armored, of course, because they may struggle against that. But still, a good uh, cavalry unit that goes from a shock cavalry, a good example of what, a cavalry unit that goes from shock cavalry to melee cavalry in the late game. Now to a regiment of renowned units, the Zintler's Reichsguard. Basically still a shock cavalry, a better melee attack than melee defense, still good armor and that shield, a good charge bonus, so they're good at being that shock cavalry. The best idea here is that they have vanguard deployment. So uh, if you know that the enemy is not going to be able to survive the, the, the uh, charge from these guys, or if you're going to have a good target for them, by all means, this becomes a great tactical advantage. I always love to see units that provide that. Uh, also, they are immune to psychology, so immune to fear and terror is always nice when fighting against those, perhaps in the, against the, the vampire counts, for instance. Count on these guys to you know deploy and just make sure that their shock value is uh, well uh, well taken advantage of by taking advantage of that charge bonus. Charge them in and they'll defeat most enemies, especially in the uh, early to mid game. Now to the Knights of the Blazing Sun. They are shock cavalry. They do have the advantage of having flaming attacks. So basically uh, any enemy units that are uh, vulnerable to that, such as uh, vampires who have regeneration, for instance, they will be good at targets for these guys. They have good melee attack, decent armor, not as much as the Reichsguard, not a lot of melee defense really, but they do have a much better charge bonus. So they are much more of a shock cavalry indeed. They do have some re spell resistance, which is always nice. Now, the main idea in the late game, they become a little bit better in terms of an offensive cavalry, really. Still much more into that shock cavalry. They have, like, uh, at the most 43 melee defense, a uh, little bit more armor, 119. But these guys should be used mostly for that fire damage in the late game, of course. Especially against anyone that is vulnerable, of course. Uh, with some supports, they could do really well, even well into the late game. Now to one of my favorite looking units, the Demigriff Knights. Look at them. So cute. So they are armored and shielded, which is really great because with that shield they can survive against those missile units, which is always awesome. They have good melee attacks and melee defense, so they are also more of a melee cavalry, actually. They're classified as a shock cavalry still, but yeah, they can do pretty well in melee. They do have armor piercing weapon strength and the good charge bonus. In addition, they also cause fear. Now in the late game, well, you can use these guys into the late game, of course. They become much more of that melee melee cavalry that I was talking about, good armor, good melee defense and attack values, even better weapon strength and still that good charge bonus. So by all means, use these guys well into the, the late game. They're better to take out any armored targets, or especially infantry for instance. But yeah, they can do well against anything that it has armored, of course. If you want something against large, seek out the next unit. So against large, we do have the Demigriff Knights with Halberds. So the main difference here is that they have the same stats, just no shields. They trade that with that Halberd. That also causes, beyond the armor piercing uh, damage, it also causes a bo uh, good bonuses versus large. So they're much better at taking down enemy cavalry, enemy monsters, enemy single entities as well. Uh, do you take advantage of that charge bonus, of course? Not a lot in terms of melee attack or melee defense, so they're kind of weaker in that regard, just more focused into defeating those uh, large targets, of course. In the late game, they can do so even just without just the shock uh, cavalry idea, because they get much better melee stats altogether. Melee defense, melee attack, uh, good armor, of course, uh, better leadership uh, as well. So all of that combines it to make them uh, quite a deadly melee cavalry against any, anti -lar uh, against any large units. And yeah, definitely use these guys throughout the game. They'll do really well in your flanks. And then we reach a regiment of renown, the Royal Altdorf Griffites. Demogriff Knights, with, still with a good armor piercing and bonuses versus large, good melee stats altogether. Of course, they get a little bit more advantage there. But the main advantage of these guys is that they cause terror, and therefore, of course, are immune to it. So uh, these are a much better unit to engage, you know, enemy single entities, for instance, that may cause terror because they won't get routed by them and they can do uh, uh, quite a lot of damage to them. Any enemy cavalry, of course, by means lords and mounts or heroes and mounts they'll do the work just be sure to keep them away from any enemy anti-large units or especially any missile units that have armor piercing because of course they lack the shield 
So for your first missile cavalry, we do have the Pistoliers. They're really fast. It's really good that they are fast because they don't have a lot of melee stats altogether. Just make sure that they are not attacked by them. Their advantage, of course, is their missile strength. So they do have quite a good missile strength, we'd say. Not a lot of armor-piercing missile damage there. Uh, still not a lot of range, but why is that still decent? Because they can fire while moving, which is always nice. And they still have Vanguard deployment. So these are good skirmishing characters for the early game, by all means. Uh, in the late game, after all the updates, they get better missile strength, more reload time, ammunition, all the basic ones. Uh, so these are a good unit for the early, maybe to mid game. But other than that, uh, you should also upgrade these into the next units that we're going to see. So still a good skirmishing unit in the early game may solve a lot of problems for you if you go with that route. To the second uh, skirmishing cav, basically the Outriders. Now still quite vulnerable, not a lot of armor, melee attack or melee defense, weak uh, weapon strength, so keep them out of harm's way. But the advantage is their range actually, 130, that's... Uh, that's as much as some uh, standard missile units from other armies, so they have quite a good range, and it's still armor-piercing missile damage, which is really cool uh, to ensure that you can go and give a nasty surprise to any enemies that don't that lack the speed to chase these guys, and you can give them the hurt with those missile uh, with those armor-piercing missiles. So they have Vanguard deployment, uh, focusing uh, still on that uh, tactical advantage, of course, and they also have the firewalls moving. So definitely a good unit to have to skirmish the enemy into your front line and then to finish them off. In the late game, they become much better, of course, at that roll. Basically, still not good enough in terms of combat stats, as you can see there, so keep them out of harm's way, keep them away from enemies. They don't get e extra speed, so be careful with that. They, they, they may be outclassed by other units, uh, such as hounds, for instance, or, you know, any dog units, so be careful with that. They won't survive that easily. Uh, their main advantage, of course, is this skirmishing idea, the vanguard. They can get into the enemy artillery, for instance, and make quick sh short work of them if the enemy lacks any any way to defeat your units so yeah it's it's a good way to have a couple of these guys in an army to make sure that the enemy splits up and it can uh, force that tactical advantage for you and now to a variety of the Outriders, the ones with Grenade Launcher. These are very anti-infantry centric, so they have a much better missile uh, attack, not a lot of range, so they lose a little bit of range to get a much better missile strength. Uh, this is explosive damage, by the way. So basically, the main idea is that these guys are really cool at eliminating some infantry units. Uh, it still causes decent uh, armor-piercing explosive damage there, so don't count them against enemy uh, armored units yet. Uh, the advantage mainly is the surprise factor with the Vanguard deployment, with the firewalls moving, a good unit to have to, on skirmish, of course, to deal with units, to enemy infantry units or even cavalry that cannot chase them well, because they'll put the hurt really well on them. In the late game, always bring a couple of these units if you wish, uh, because they'll do their job really well, skirmishing into your back line, and uh, together with other missile units or some uh, support, they can do the hurt to anyone, really. Uh, better weapon strength... A better missile strength, sorry, better reload time, which is always excellent on these kinds of units. And still quite a decent uh, amount of ammunition, so they won't run out of it and they'll be able to put the hurt on anything. Good against clumps of units as well, so be wary if you're facing those types of armies. By all means, a couple of uh, grenade launchers will do just nicely. Now to a sort of chariot unit, the War Wagons. Basically, this is just a, a good platform to have some hand gunners there, so good armor-piercing missile strength, that's their main usage. Not a lot in terms of combat stats, decent armor, but not a lot of speed too, so be careful of trying to engage them in combat. These are not a chariot, they're supposed to be right, a missile chariot. And even in the late game, that's the advantage that you'll have. They have good range compared to other missile uh, chariots as well, so don't come them off. They're good at sniping enemy lords, targets, you know, enemy single entities, maybe monster units, but still decent against anything that has armor, really. Uh, and the reload time, the fact that they get reload time, the fact that they get some better missile strength and more ammunition just makes them much better at that that uh, idea. They do get some ward safe and missile resistance, so don't count them out, uh, but just don't try to put them into melee. The best they can actually get is actually 17 melee defense, so they're very vulnerable to that keep them support, keep them out of harm's way, use that speed and ensure that the others get destroyed first. 
If you prefer something more of a mobile artillery unit, then seek no further. You have the war wagons with mortars. Basically a mortar unit uh, trapped uh, inside that uh, wagon. So they will do the damage. Not a lot of uh, missile strength compared to the typical mortars that you can get. But of course you have that advantage of mobility. If that is the case, by all means these guys the, the, will put the hurt on enemy infantry. Clumps of archers for instance, that will be their main targets really because of the arc of fire. Just put them out of harm's way. Don't put them in melee at all. They, they won't survive it. And keep them away from enemy missiles or enemy skirmishing cavalry because they'll do the damage to them. In the late game, of course, as you can see there, they gain a lot of ammunition, better missile strength, so they'll just become much better at their uh, supposed role, and particularly that reload time diminishes almost to the half of it, so that's really great to ensure that these guys can remain useful into the late game. If you like the unit, if you like that mobility in an artillery, by all means, bring a couple of these guys, they'll put the hurt. Now to a very good regiment of renown, the Black Lions, the war wagons with Hell Blasters. So they do have armored piercing missiles and it's a Hell Blaster on a wagon so it benefits from that speed. It still has quite a decent amount of missile strength, good against uh, clumps of infantry, good against, you know, cavalry units, even some uh, monstrous infantry for sure. That range is still very good so they can keep out of harm's way with their speed and they still can dish out a lot of damage, just be sure. Be sure uh, like always, don't put them into melee combat because they won't survive, but overall a very good uh, artillery piece to have, especially because of that movement. That's the way they should be used, uh, particularly useful against those targets that uh, don't have a lot of mobility or that have a lot of mobility so that you can keep these units out of harm's way. So anything that has, you know, skirmishing cavalry, flying units, for instance, be wary of those, but still it's better to have these than the typical artillery that will just get wrecked by them. A good addition to the Empire roster for sure. So for your first artillery we have the mortars. Basically uh, quite a good range uh, over there. They don't have a lot of missile strength but still it's good explosive damage as well so this is good against those clumps of units by all means. Good uh, good against archers or units that have to typically stay stationary so that's the main use that I would find for them. Of course they fire in an arc so they're great in sieges as well for that purpose. In the late game of course you can still bring a couple of these guys to use again against those infantry units units, just make sure that you don't target anything that has a lot of armor, because they don't have a lot of armor piercing, uh, but still, decent, uh, quite good staple unit to have in any stage of the game. Of course, you may wish to go into better artillery units later on, because the Empire does have them. <laughs> Now to the great cannons, they are good anti-large, even though they don't have that anti-large bonus, by the way, they're good anti-large because of their accuracy. And one of the best things that they have is actually such a long range, 450, it's about one of the best ranges that you can get, especially uh, uh, to, uh, you know, a unit that is, isn't really that difficult to uh, obtain in campaign. So overall, these are good against those uh, single entities, those monsters, uh, infantry perhaps, uh, not that really that good against infantry, but they can put the hurt on them because they do have that armor piercing missile damage. So be wary. You can still use these guys against those. Of course, the, the main purpose is that anti-large. In the late game, they'll do a lot more damage and they'll take much reduced time in reloading. So even better to snipe the enemy artillery, for instance. This is the one of the main uses that I have for them. And then I'll start hitting their lord, hero or single entities. That's always a good use. But by all means, you can use these guys against cavalry, anything really. Always a good deal to bring a couple of these in any army. Now for Regiment of Renown, the Hammer of the Witches. These are great cannons. Still the same thing with the with no anti-large uh, bonus, but quite a lot of missile strength. And the ammunition is magical, so they're much better at wrecking those... Uh, 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 immune to th those physical resistant uh, units, of course, maybe demon units. These will put the hurt on them, and especially with that missile strength, they can wreck anything really, infantry, cavalry, whatever. But they are just better at that anti-large, at, uh, at those large targets because of that anti-large idea. Good accuracy, of course. Uh, they also have that g good range, so yeah, uh, definitely one of the best artilleries to snipe enemy artilleries. That's how I use these guys for the most part, but by all means, can target anything with them. 
not a very good artillery unit, the Hellblaster Volley Guns. Basically, they don't have a lot of range, but they change that with the have really heavy missile strength. They shoot a lot of shots per volley, 9 shots, and they are armor piercing. So these are great to mow down heavily armored infantry units, heavy armored cavalry for sure. They can put the hurt on single entities and uh, 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 monsters infantry as well, but for the most part I'll use them against smaller targets and they'll really wreck them. Especially in the late game, as you can see, they're more missile strength, even less reload time, so they'll do their damage much faster as well, which is also important that it gives that uh, that factor also with the uh, the leadership debuffs, you know, for taking too much damage in a, long, uh, a very short amount of time, so that's uh, uh, one of their purposes as well, to heavily diminish the front line, not only in terms of leadership, but also, of course, in terms of men. Now to one of the favorites of many people, the Hellstorm Rocket Battery. Just that range alone is really good, 480, and they have armor-piercing missile damages that also have explosive damage, so these guys will put the hurt on anything infantry, archers, other artillery units. They don't have a lot of accuracy, which is why as soon as possible you should get more XP for them to increase that accuracy, because yes, accuracy can be increased with uh, XP, of course, and in the late game they can deal with anything. They can deal with anything, of course, in the mid game where you get them, and up until the, the late game by all means, uh, especially with more reload speed and even more weapon strength and still more ammunition. These guys will put a hurt on any enemies, and even if they, they, if they bring two armies, three armies, the better. They'll be really detrimental against most of the enemies that you'll face. So a couple of these, or three, or four, or even a full stack of them if you wish to go for a doom stack, by all means, they're really good at their job. Now for a regiment of renown, the Sun Maker. They do have lesser ammunition, but much bigger missile strength. Uh, just the flaming attacks alone will do a lot of damage to those vulnerable to fire. Just be sure to not bring them against those who have fire resistance, such as Francis Chaos Dwarfs. Well, they still put the, a lot of hurt to them. A nice addition for your uh, artillery units. By all means, they, they do have such a, a good range and missile strength, you can put the hurt on anything. And yeah, always bring, as soon as you get these guys, always bring them uh, to... Um, to face off against clumps of units because they'll just wreck everything. <laughs> Now to a unit that has been enhanced lately, the Luminarch of Hish. So the main idea of this is it's a magic chariot, an artillery of sorts, good for sniping enemies, so they do have such a massive missile strength, they take quite a long time to, to reload, they used to, because now they don't. And you can even reduce this a lot by the late game, so they're good at sniping enemy uh, single entities, lords, heroes, they can put the hurt on anything really, they do have magical and flaming ammunition so uh, decent range as well, which is always nice. So they have also an aura of protection that uh, affects allies in range, so it gives a ward save, so they're also good to bring near your infantry units, sniping those lords from afar, and when the, uh, the clash of the infantry happens, they'll give them some ward save, which is always nice. And they also have this uh, reduced power recharge for enemies in range, which is always good, so their spellcasters won't have that bigger of... Um, of uh, an advantage against you. So yeah, always nice to bring a couple of these guys to snipe enemy single entities, especially in the late game. Look at those, the, that missile strength, it's impressive. They don't need anything else, just one hit and they'll, suddenly the enemy lord will be thinking twice on engaging anything. Now to a regiment of renown, the Tempelhof Luminarch. So this is a much better unit, basically in terms of how much damage it causes. It's still that magical ammunition and flaming, good against single entities, really armor piercing missiles, of course. So the, it still has that locus of Hish. It still has that aura of protection like the previous one. It does have encourage, which is great, g giving a leadership bonus to nearby allies. So keep them uh, close to the front line. Don't engage in melee, of course, like the other those. The advantage is that it has three charges of the net of Amintog. So it's great to <laughs> just put the, the enemy lord, for instance, or a, a good hero or single entity, just make sure that it doesn't move for 20 seconds and you put the hurt on it with all the missiles that you have or anything that you wish. A good tactical option and definitely a good addition to any army. 
And finally, we reach the steam tank. Now, this is a war machine. You basically you can use them as a chariot if you wish, but be careful. Not a lot of melee defense. Tons of armor, really. And it is unbreakable, but it does mean that it will suffer. It will suffer damage for sure. So, it's not really a, a melee unit. His, its focus, it does have good weapon strength and armor, piercing weapon damage, and even a bonus versus infantry. But, to rate rate, the best idea for him is the missile strength. They will, he it will shoot it has a decent range, so he'll shoot against enemy single entities, elder artillery, for instance. It's really good for, for, for them to hit anything that really is not moving, of course, for the important in terms of the accuracy. Uh, one of the main uses in any army is their terror ability. So it's one of the few units that causes terror, which is great to have uh, always. So if, if the enemy is uh, suffering already, if they are, don't have really... Uh, a lot of leadership, such as the Greenskins, the Skaven, then he can put the hurt on them, just charging around and making sure that the enemy gets frightened and leaves. So always a good idea to bring these guys for single entity sniping, perhaps, you know, uh, just to, to survive, basically. They, they can survive a little bit on their own, uh, but with support, then they're much better. In the late game, they do get a little bit more ward save and better uh, stats in terms of their missile uh, strength as well, so uh, focusing more always on that uh, uh, strength uh, in terms of the range attacks, uh, but as always, try to keep them out of harm's way of combat. It's more of a ranged uh, unit other than the melee unit for certain, but still quite a decent unit to have in the list. And there you go. All the Empire units with the upgrades, without the upgrades, so that you can make better decisions on, on the battlefield and on the campaign on which units recruit and why. I hope this in it was helpful, of course, that's the, the main idea here. And do share your opinion below. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.